Well, today is the third installment of a series on God's providence in the life of Joseph from Genesis 37 through 50. Let's go ahead and begin our time with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, you are holy and we come under your word again today. Lord, not only so that we can learn details, but so that we can glean from it how to respond to your word, how to respond to all that you have disclosed to us. Lord, and I pray that that's the case this morning, that with the work that we've done in three short weeks, looking at a third of the book of Genesis, Lord, that, that you would resonate in our hearts how we must respond to the moments that we find uncertainty in. Lord, thank you so much for this time together. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, all right. The last two weeks, we have reviewed 11 of the 14-chapter narrative concerning Joseph. And if you recall, we have two goals with this series. We've covered a lot of material, and I have it up there on the screen for you. The two goals that we have for this series is to, number one, get re-familiarized with the details of the Joseph story. And we've done that. We've seen that the Joseph narrative is not simply a children's book story. It's actually much more detailed than that. When Joseph was sent to Egypt, he was sent into slavery in a very brutal way, naked, thrown into a hole, and then sold. It was a brutal ordeal. And he was sent in a chain gang down to Egypt at 290 miles before he was sold to the captain of the guard, Potiphar, who worked for Pharaoh. And all of that time, for him, God's word, that is the promises that had been given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were more formative to him than the chains that he was in. More formative than the circumstances he found himself in. We saw that his personal integrity before God was uncompromising, despite awful circumstances for a 13-year period when he was sent to Egypt until he stood before Pharaoh at 30 years old. We've seen that his hope was fixed on the end game of God's promises, not on his own circumstances. There was nothing to hope in there. And so we've gleaned that. When he was made ruler of Egypt, We've seen all those details and even the archaeological record bears witness to what he did when he changed the landscape, quite literally, um, building record size dikes, levees, and irrigation systems and 110,000 acres of, of farmland that would serve to fill granaries in every city. And so his administration was quite busy. And of course, he also changed the political landscape. Two years into that famine, He not only bought all of the fields, all of the people's animals and livestock, but the people themselves. And so the entire system of nobles in that monarchy was done away with overnight. And so his impact was lasting. All the while, his family came down to Egypt and were placed in Goshen in the city of Avaris and preserved from slavery at first. And so the stage was set for God to build a nation. The stage was set for God to make a nation and to subject that nation to slavery for 400 years, just as he told Abraham he would in Genesis 15. And so number one goal from refamiliarize ourselves with the details of that story. And then goal number two is to equip you to think rightly about the providence of God in your life. And remember the definition of providence is, God's sovereignty plus his purposes, and you live under the umbrella of God's providence. Difficulty and hostility will come to God's people, and and there's a right way to respond to that. And so that's why we are looking at this text. That's what we must glean from this passage. Today, our primary text will be Genesis 50, 15 through 21. So go ahead and open your Bibles and turn to that passage, if you would. Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21. We're going to go ahead and read that text, and then we'll back up and arrive there with 
the narrative. Read here with me. Verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for the, all the wrong, which we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive. I beg you the transgression of your brothers and their sin for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them, spoke to their hearts. This passage is one of those monumental texts in the Bible that supports the consistent, the, the consistently seen throughout scripture Doctrine that God is always good to his people. God is always good to his people. And if you've ever been to Egypt or Greece, or you've seen a Roman ruin, you likely have seen large columns supporting big stone beams. And, and on those stone beams is written what that structure is. And so if the doctrine of God's goodness to his people are the stone beams, that doctrine is supported by the pillars of truth that we find throughout our Bible. And pillars like Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Passages that follow that says the gifts of the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And the context in Romans 11 is pertains to what we are looking at in Genesis 50 columns of truth, like Hebrews 13, I will never desert you. I will never forsake you. And of course, texts like Genesis 50, what you meant for evil, God purposed, intended for good. And so before we get to the outcome of Jacob's death and, the, and its aftermath, which is what this passage is all about between Joseph and his brothers, let's back up and look at how all that came to pass. Turn to Genesis 20, or I'm sorry, 47, 27. This is where we left off last week. Now, Israel, that's Jacob, lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time for Israel, when it was time for Israel to die and it drew near, he called on his son, Joseph and said to him, please, if I have found favor in your sight, place now your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt. But when I lie down with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. Jacob says, swear to me. So he swore to him. Then Israel bowed in worship at the head of his bed. Now it came about after these things that Joseph was told, behold, your father is sick. So he took his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. And when it was told to Jacob, behold, your son jo Joseph has come to you. Israel collected his strength and sat up in bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan as Bethlehem and blessed me and said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and numerous and I will make you a company of peoples and will give you this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. 
And so what unfolds is two chapters that cover one event, Jacob's death, just before Jacob dies. He calls Joseph, he, Joseph brings his sons, and, Joseph, and Jacob blesses Ephraim and Manasseh. So jo- Joseph has this private time with Joseph and his sons. And um, I just want you to see what he says. This is the, the center of what he says to Joseph and his sons. Look at verse 15, 48, 15. He blessed Joseph and said, the God before, before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all of my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. And may my name live on in them and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the land. And so what follows is time that Joseph has with, um, that Jacob has with Joseph. And at the end of that private time, look at verse 21, Israel said to Joseph, behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. I give you one portion more than your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. Then Jacob summoned his sons and said, assemble yourselves that I may tell you what may befall you in the days to come. And so now he gathers all of his brothers and they all assemble and come to Jacob to hear prophecy concerning them and each one of their individual legacies. And he begins by saying, I will tell you what's going to happen literally in the last days. And that's the first of a, of a formula that you see repeated over and over in the old Testament in the last days, in the last days, Moses uses in the last days, that phrase four times in the law. And each one has an eschatological aim. This is what's going to happen at the end. And then later the prophets Another 21 times later, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the minor prophets point to the last days and say, here's what's going to happen in the last days. And all of it is eschatological, some of which has occurred and some of it has not. In fact, the New Testament apostles refer to the last days in present and future tense. These are the last days. And so what's in view here are things that still yet have events to occur, even from our perspective. Many of them, some of them have already occurred. We really only have time to look at two. So I want you to look at number one, prophecy concerning Judah. Look at 49.10. Jacob says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff between his, from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. The word Shiloh is only used in the Bible in this one place. And it means the one to whom it belongs. And so now what Jacob has done, what his fathers did was dispense and expand the blessings of God. And now Jacob is doing the same saying, okay, now you look for the messianic seed promise to come from Judah's tribe. And so now we have a new place to look towards. And the Israelites would have looked towards Judah's tribe for another, well, centuries all the way until you get to David until the promise is expanded once more. And then I also want you to see Joseph because we're reading about the story of Joseph. So let's see what Jacob has to say to him. Look at verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a spring. Its branches run all over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him and shot at him and harassed him. But his bow remained firm and his arms were agile. Verse 24, the idea there is that he remained steadfast. And we've seen that throughout the entire narrative. Psalm 105, 17 bears witness to that. That from the moment the, bitter, the archers shot arrows at him, metaphorically, when he was put into chains, sent down to Egypt, he was determined to be fixed on the hope of God's promises. His arms remained firm on God's words. 
And so once he finishes blessing and giving prophecy to all of his sons, you can see in verse 33, it says, when jo Joseph finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into the bed and breathed his last. And he was gathered to his people. So two chapters covering that same event. And what transpires after that is Joseph embraces his father, kisses him on the head, and then the embalming process begins. Egypt mourns for 70 days. And so this was a huge ordeal. Jacob, even amongst the Egyptians and amongst Pharaoh was uh, saw, uh, thought very highly of, of course, Joseph, I'm sorry, Jacob blesses Pharaoh and Jacob dies under the same Pharaoh's rule. And then you see the account of the funeral procession, a lot of detail here. And it's quite interesting. Look at verse seven of chapter 50. So Joseph went up to bury his father and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, all the elders of the land of Egypt and all the household of Joseph and his brothers and his father's household. They left only their little ones and their flocks and their herds in the land of Goshen. There also went up with them both chariots and horsemen. And it was a very great company. So they go to the land of Canaan. They bury his father. And so this is a very big deal. It's so big that in verse 11, it says, Now when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning of the Egyptians. And so this is a really big deal. And so after Joseph buries his father, he comes back to Egypt along with the rest of his brothers. And then we get to our primary text, beginning in verse 15, where Joseph and his brothers respond to this milestone in their lives. It's a milestone that they all shared, but they respond differently. And imagine that. We've been seeing that throughout the course of the narrative, and really nothing has changed in some way. In certain ways, some things have changed. There's peace, there's disclosure, Yet, yet some things just haven't changed. And so what we're going to see in our text are, is, is one milestone and two responses. And I want you to glean from the rest of this passage that there are two responses to milestone moments. Two responses to milestone moments. The first one is found in verses 15 through 18, and it's brought to us by his brothers, the band of brothers. And that is doubting God's providence, doubting God's providence. They had lived peacefully in the land for 17 years and, and now dad had died and the glue that had held them together, the brothers, as far as the band of brothers was concerned, was gone. And they needed to respond to this moment. For Joseph's brothers, Jacob's death was a milestone they needed to respond to. And they begin with, with an introspection of the wrong kind. Now, now there's a good introspection, a, a critique of your own heart to see what lines up with, with God and his purposes and, and his character. And then there's an introspection of the wrong kind that's driven by fear. And that's where they begin. Look at verse 15. When Joseph saw that his brothers, that his father was dead, they said, what if? And, and, the, and the question of probability is not really here. You can see the English text kind of splits the difference because there's no question mark. But, but there is probability here. And so what, what, what you might say is Joseph probably bears a grudge against this. And then that probability advances to certainty as, as their expression continues. It says he probably bears a grudge against us and will pay us back in full. And the, the idea there of, of fullness is translated in most of the English texts. The Holman Standard actually translates it in a very helpful way. It says, he probably bears a grudge against us, and he will certainly return all the evil that we have done against him. So the emphasis is not so much on the outcome, a full outcome, but on the certainty of the action. And so doubt and fear has entered their hearts and they're operating accordingly. They are convinced. They, they've, they've come to a self-focused conclusion 
and they make plans for self-preservation. So they have already looked inwardly, so to speak, amongst themselves, not considered things outside of themselves, and they've come to this self-focused conclusion and then begin this plan for self-preservation. And so that's, a, if you're taking notes, this is a pattern to avoid uh, in your response to milestones, introspection, self-focused conclusions, and self-preservation. That's just a natural fleshly instinct. When difficulty comes suddenly, we're temp- the temptation might be to make rash decisions. When severe trials are brought into our lives, We often want to match the severity with some extreme response. Likewise, when difficulty or hostility is prolonged, say in a relationship, the temptation there may be to avoid counsel at all because it's just too too much baggage to work through. And so when you begin with the introspection of of the wrong kind like these brothers did, you're bound to have a, a lousy outcome to your response. And all of this is happening in some measure here. Instead of rejoicing in God's providence for the brothers, they work inwardly and they say to themselves, ah, Joseph's probably out to get us. And so they cook up a plan of self-preservation. They send a message. This is a message not of their own, or I'm sorry, this is not them leaving. This is on the lips of messengers. They send a canary into the coal mine, so to speak, just to see what's going to happen. How's Joseph going to respond? Because we're already positive what's going to happen. We're certain. They sent a message saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive your brothers. I beg you. Really? Did, did, we just looked at the deathbed account of Jacob and there was no begging of Joseph. In fact, Jacob, who blesses Pharaoh, is begging Joseph? Hmm? Eh, I, I, I don't think that's the case here. Before Jacob died, he could have reserved a message, I suppose, back at the ranch in Goshen for 17 years, but I don't think that's what's happening here. The the idea here where it says before he died is literally in the face of death. So the brothers are claiming that something happened right there in the face of death before he died. And and we see from the text that that one event where where Jacob takes his feet out of his bed, prophesies concerning his sons, And then he puts his feet back in bed and and dies. Those are the bookends to those two chapters. And so we know that was one event and that didn't occur. We didn't see any begging of Joseph. So fear has moved to manipulation as they send a message to him, this canary in the coal mine, to the prime minister of Egypt. And so from this place of fear, they've taken a risky gamble if they believe what they say they believe. This is the most powerful man in the land. The whole premise, their whole premise was wrong, but they were right about one thing. I want you to see the end of verse 17. In their message, they say, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. So so they appeal to, to Joseph as the servants of the God of his father, the, the, the one who, who Joseph beloves, the one who Joseph has depended on. They put themselves in proximity to that, to, to that God in their message. And it's their God too. But this is indeed manipulation. And so Joseph weeps. Look at the end of verse 17. Joseph wept when they spoke to him, the messengers, that is. These are not tears of joy or relief. Finally, the dream that I had years ago came true. I'm in charge now. They finally see it. They're, they're seeking my forgiveness, and, they've, and I've been waiting for that moment. That, that's not what's going on here. In fact, when he named his son Manasseh, he says, God has caused me to forget all my trouble and all the trouble of my father's household. He had moved on. He had mortified any bitterness in his own heart, and he had moved on a long time ago. These are tears of of grief. You guys still don't get it. You still don't get it. We, We went over this 17 years ago. You see what God's been doing. We've We've met and we've had reconciliation. 
I've given you comfort. And yet they didn't maintain those things. They weren't locked on to God's purposes for that period of time, that 17 years that they were in the land before Jacob dies. And so they were not tears of relief, but tears of grief. Turn back to Genesis 45 for just a moment. There's good reason for him to be grieved. He had given them good counsel and God's purposes when they first came. And we looked at this briefly, but look at verse 5, 45, 5. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before he sent you to preserve life. Of course, in the Hebrew, that to preserve life purpose clause is right at the front. That was the first and only thing on Joseph's mind. Primary. And then look at verse seven. God sent me to preserve for you a remnant in the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. And we talked about this last week where Joseph had God's promises on his mind in this moment, because we see all the things here that were delivered to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a remnant for the land and a great number of survivors. And then he says to them in verse 24, do not quarrel on your journey. That is number one in verse five, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves, literally in your own eyes. That, don't do the introspection of the wrong kind. And, and, and don't be agitated with one another. That will derail you from God's purposes, from seeing clearly. And so 17 years goes by, and it's as if they have forgotten those things. They were aware of them. They knew them, and they, were, they knew all of God's promises. In fact, remember last week, we said that, that Joseph's brothers had been in proximity for longer with Jacob and, their, and his father, Isaac, than Joseph ever had. But, but God never gives his people less than enough to live by faith, and Joseph did just that. At 17 years old, he had an, a sufficient amount of God's promises to lock onto and be fixed on for the rest of his life. And that's what we see in, in his entire life. So 17 years had passed, and, and, and they, they had gotten perhaps lazy with what they knew to be true. And acting as if they were unaware of the umbrella of God's providence, they revert back to fear and uncertainty. And so the brothers bow down before him. Look at verse 18. This is what happens after the message was sent to him. He didn't respond host, host, with a hostile response. And so the brothers go and bow down right before him. Verse 18, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your slaves. We are your servants. So in a last ditch effort to solve an imaginary problem, they surrender themselves as slaves. And so you've got to, you've got to think whatever they imagine must have been worse than that worse than being enslaved. And after all, Joseph had bought all the Egyptians for Pharaoh as slaves uh, 15 years earlier. So they have succumbed to their own fears and enslaved by a guilty conscience aimed at the best outcome for themselves. Everything about their disposition at this milestone in their lives has an inward focus. God's future promises had taken a back seat to their thought process. And, and so with the framework of self and circumstance, they met this milestone by doubting God's providence. The band of brothers were exposed to all the same promises that Joseph was. And we just said that, they were in proximity to Jacob and Isaac for closer and longer than anything Joseph had experienced. And yet, here he is, Joseph, at 56 years old in this moment. And while his brothers are having a midlife crisis, 
Joseph is having midlife clarity because he had been fixed on God's promises for the long run. His response to this moment is altogether different. Joseph's response is the response that you must aim at in advance. Don't be fooled. Hostility is coming. Difficulty is coming. And you need to determine for yourself in advance that when that difficulty comes, when the hostility, affliction comes, that you will have midlife or whatever stage your life is in clarity because you are locked in on what God says is true. What God says will happen. There is nothing this side of heaven to fix your hope on. Enjoy life. Read Ecclesiastes. Enjoy every gift that God has given to you, but don't fix your hope on things that are passing. Fixing your hope on things that are passing will not supply the endurance that you need to get to the end. The endurance that you need as a believer to get to the end faithfully is supplied by the fuel of God's future promises. And so how does Joseph respond? Joseph responds by doubling down on faith. Doubling down on faith. It's what you must do. And he's doubling down because he's already disclosed God's purposes. He's already disclosed his forgiveness, if you will. And he's demonstrated that to the brothers for 17 years. And he's, and and so what he does in this moment is he's doing the same thing that he has done in every moment when he was put into chains, when he was sold to Potiphar, when he was falsely accused, when he was thrown in a prison, when he was forgotten by the baker and the cupbearer. When he stood before Pharaoh and the iron chains came off and the gold chains came on, he doubled down on God's purposes, on his promises. He doubled down on faith. So let's continue. Look at verse 19. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. (laughs) Am I in God's place? His very first response is addressing the root cause of their introspection, their self-focused conclusions, he can see it clearly. Fear. You guys are afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He comforts them and he relieves their fears. And, and, and it's important to notice patterns in your Bible. 27 times in the book of Genesis, someone is afraid of something. And, and nine times in this narrative, someone is afraid of something. The, the Jacob is afraid. The brothers are afraid. And Joseph expresses fear once. Only one time is fear on the lips of Joseph. And he says, I fear God. That's where you need to be. So he redirects their humility, which is genuine. They've come and they've laid down before Joseph. They have genuine humility here, but it's, it's, it's aimed at the wrong person. It's aimed at Joseph more so than it needs to be. Their fear should be under, pointed towards God, not Joseph. And so he redirects their humility by saying, am I in God's place? I see this fear coming at me. That, that, That fear should not come to me. You should have the fear of God, not of man. All this bowing down business declaring yourself slaves of Joseph. You must entrust yourselves to God, not to me. Perhaps you will see clearly. See, there's more at work here than your personal situation. And that's key. There's more to work here than your personal situation. It's from that perspective that you can assess your situation more clearly. When the world is closing in on you, and you don't know what to do next. You don't know what your next move is. You can't lose sight of the fact that God is working out his purposes in the midst of your difficulty. 
Last week, Daniel said to me, wow, what's it like to find yourself right in the middle of God's providence? That's right. That is a good perspective to, to keep in front of you. Right in the middle of God's providence. Not forgotten about. Not outside the umbrella of his providence, but right under it. And so what comes next is no trouble for Joseph. He responds to his brothers in verse 20 with that verse you know. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. That is, while you meant evil against me, concurrent with your evil motives, concurrent with the outcomes you were aiming at, concurrent with your intentions, God had intentions and they were being played out at the same time. Your intentions did not threaten God's purposes. Now that's something you can stand on. That's something that you can remain immovable on. Someone else's hostile uh, 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 intentions towards you, difficulties that come in affliction, even though they might intend for your bad, they are no threat to God's purposes in your life. And we see that in the text. And I want you to notice one thing. Notice that Joseph doesn't say for my good. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for my good. Now that's true. That's the other pillar. That's Romans 8, 28, supporting the same truth that Joseph is supporting with this pillar of truth. But what, what, what Joseph zeroes in on are God's purposes. While, while his brothers are at the center of their own thinking, Joseph is like the guy who forgets to number himself when he makes reservations at the table. He is not even in it. He is so locked into God's purposes. And so he to over, totally overlooks his, the, the, the personal offense of the moment, the manipulation that came, and he zeroes in on God's purposes. Look at verse 20b. He reminds him of what God was doing. God meant it to for good in order to bring about this present result to keep a great many people alive, to keep alive a great number of people. And so God's purposes in this moment are being accomplished. You know, they had gone down to Egypt and when they met Joseph, Jacob's household was 70. So this is 17 years later. They're what? hundred, hundred or so. A few chapters later into the Exodus, 383 years later, when Moses leads them out of Egypt, they number 600,000 men walking alone. Men on foot, including women and children. The, the number is probably something like 2 million. So God was building a nation. That's what he was doing. I believe Joseph knew exactly what God was up to because God had disclosed plenty enough to know that, that his people would be slaves in a land 400 years. And here they are established, protected for the moment and actually free for about a hundred years. And, and until that, that Pharaoh came along that didn't know Joseph, didn't know his legacy, unfamiliar with it and then put the huge number of Israelites into bondage. So God was building a nation and he said he would do so ahead of time when he told Abraham, Isaac, and jo Jacob that he would give them descendants that would outnumber the stars and the sand, that the land of Canaan from the Nile to the Euphrates, not a metaphorical land, but the land that Abraham could see and the land that Jacob pitched his tents on, that land where their feet were would become theirs and their descend descendants forever. Moreover, a king that would conquer his enemies and reign over all peoples, over every people group. That was disclosed to them. And so the expectation that God had given them, Joseph and his fathers lived by, their hope was not in a present circumstance. They believed all of God's promises. And those promises were so compelling from one patriarch to the next that even though one didn't obtain the promises, the next lived in expectation of them. Abraham's death didn't deter Isaac's expectation. 
And Isaac's expectation, I'm sorry, when Isaac died, Jacob was still convinced that the promises that God had given to Abraham and to Isaac would come to pass. That the details of those promises would come to fruition. They took God at his word. And they, and they believed him for a century, expecting those details and promises to come, to come to pass just as they were delivered. I want you to open your Bibles to uh, Hebrews 11 for just a moment. Both the death of Jacob and Joseph are included in that text. And since we're looking at that narrative, it, was, it would be good to get a divine commentary on what we're seeing the patterns in Genesis 49 through 50. The author of Hebrews inciting the faith of Jacob and Joseph go back to the death of each one to demonstrate the kind of faith that endures all the way to the end. And because we're in the narrative of those accounts, we need to look at the God given commentary on the takeaways that we cannot miss first And this is good advice for whenever you open this chapter of your Bible. Let's look at the definition of faith. 11.1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. This language is so strong here. There was stronger language in the English vocabulary for rock-solid conviction. We would use it. Nevertheless, the definition of faith The kind of faith modeled by Jacob and Joseph is defined in two ways that work together. The assurance of things hoped for is a confidence that the object of your hope is 100% going to come to pass. Not if, not maybe, but certainly. So much so that you order your life in expectation of those things. The conviction of things unseen limits the object of hope associated with biblical faith. The things not seen comes from the word from which we get the word program. An undertaking. So not anything unseen, not anything imagined, but specific things, a sequence of events that drive to a final outcome. That's a textbook definition of this word. And in context, the program, the sequence of events is the redemptive plan that God would put in place, that he did put in place long before the patriarchs, that has remained unchanged even in the church age. I read a book last year called uh, The Church and God's Program. And And when I first bought it, I thought, that's kind of a funny title. God's program. But indeed, he has a program. He has a sequence of events. And they're, and they're not reactive. They're planned out in his providence in advance. And that book just covers the, how the church fits into God's unchanging plans and how the role of the church, uh, uh, what the role of the church is in the life of the New Testament believer. So faith is a conviction of the details that make up God's redemptive plan. Jacob and Joseph were convinced of what God had disclosed to them. And so let's go ahead and look at that. First, go ahead and look at Isaac in verse 20, 11, 20. This is just such a, a vivid illustration of the definition of faith. Perhaps that's why Isaac gets one verse. By faith, Isaac, vivid. That might be a pun in this, in this text. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau regarding things to come. That is, when Isaac was blind... When Isaac was blind and and his intentions were to bless Esau. And when Jacob comes in the room, what I I feel, what I smell, even my intentions, something's not right. It's because it's Jacob. He stole a blessing in God's providence. And, And yet by faith, because he is blind and could not see, he did not depend on his own senses to move forward with what he knew he had to do then by faith. He dispensed the blessing, the one-time blessing 
Look at verse 21. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, that's what we just read, blessed each of, his, each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. So Jacob blesses Ephraim and Manasseh and then leans on the top of his staff and worships. This is what makes God's trophy case of Hebrews 11. Jacob leaning on a stick. And, and you say, well, that's kind of interesting because Jacob wrestled with God. He renamed a pagan town Luz to Bethel, house of God. And, and I mean, he did so many things. And yet what God considers worth putting in his trophy case is that he worshiped. And what did that worship look like? Well, we just read it. He, he knew what God would do. And by faith said, okay, I won't be around for this. Nothing I can do to contribute to it. I'm about to die. Boys, here's what's going to happen. He, he had had 12 sons and a really messy family. But he said, you know what? Nothing, no intentions of my sons are going to stop God's purposes. Here's what's going to happen, boys. And so that's what he did by faith. He believed God. He believed God's words. Both Jacob and Joseph believed what he said was going to happen and was absolutely uh, convinced that every detail would come to pass. Likewise, Joseph believed every detail that God had disclosed to him and his fathers. A land, descendants without number, a king and a kingdom. And none of them expected those things to come to pass in their own lifetime. God would have to raise them from the dead at some future time in order for those details to come to pass. Abraham knew God was able to raise the dead. Jacob or Job, I'm sorry, had an expectation to be resurrected before he would see God in his own flesh. Look at 1122. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. Go ahead and turn back to Genesis 50 and let's look at that account. We'll begin in verse 24. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. But God will surely take care of you and bring you up from the land, from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years old, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Joseph would have been given a state funeral. And sometimes when we think about Joseph giving orders concerning his bones, we don't remember what is implied there, what, the, what his sons and brothers would have heard by that. What, what he's essentially saying is, is you need to do some tomb raiding. Now that's illegal. I'm certain of it. I haven't found the text that says that was illegal back then, but I'm positive it was. He's, he's saying, go ahead and tomb raid, okay? That, that would be a big undertaking. So he was buried in Deshar, which is just south of Cairo, about 20 minutes on the, on, on the highway that's presently there, next to Sarosis, the, uh, uh, Sesostris III's pyramid, where his officials were buried. Uh, it seems like we, we, we can have some certainty around that. And so what he's saying is, look, in 383 years, God will bring about an exodus. And, 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 and as we know, that exodus was so compelling to the Egyptians that, that, that when Moses came and said, let my people go, that by the 10th plague, he said, take whatever you want. And the Egyptians gave them gold and silver and chariots. And so the sons of Israel went and took Joseph's sarcophagus out of the tomb and took him with them when they crossed the Red Sea and went into the land eventually. 
So the order that he gives his sons is, is akin to one of our forefathers, perhaps saying, uh, George Washington, uh, you know, in three, 400 years, I want you to come to Mount, Mount Vernon and take my bones. That's a pretty big deal. Although I, I'm convinced it was even, an even bigger deal. This was one of the most consequential rulers of uh, the ancient Near East ever. And so 383 years later, as Moses is recounting the story to the wilderness generations, Joseph is in a tent right here. I mean, God's been faithful to his promises. God, is, God, God said that there would be an exodus and God had disclosed all that he needed to, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and he was bringing all of his purposes to pass. You would have expected Joseph to be buried maybe in Hebron with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with his fathers. In fact, Joseph probably was just as famous, probably more famous worldwide, so to speak, than, than Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So you'd expect him to be given a, a, a tomb, a, a, a burial in that place. And maybe the instructions would have been, well, bury me with mom in Bethlehem. But that's not he, was what he did. Those weren't his instructions. In Joshua 24, we see that Joseph was buried in Shechem. Why Shechem? Joseph was buried in the land that Jacob had given to him as a double portion. I believe that Joseph was looking forward to a resurrection just as early Old Testament saints had, just as later Old Testament saints had, just as we do. And so as you read this long passage in your Bible, you need to pay attention to the details. And then as you read the rest of your Bible, you need to pay attention to the details and fix your hope on the details because it's the details that will give you endurance all the way through the end. Platitudes and well-wishing just will not provide endurance. But the details that you can fix your hope on are worth fixing your hope on because they will give you endurance all the way to the end. Let's go ahead and pray as we finish up. Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the opportunity to examine your text, Lord. And I pray that for everyone here who has spent the time in, in these 14 chapters and for all of us believers, Lord, that you would give us the details, that you would bring those things to mind so that we can set our hope on them, so that we would be able to shrug off difficulty more easily or that we would depend on how you've put us into your program of redemption, Lord, in the New Testament church age. Lord, we look forward to the day when, even after we've passed, we would be resurrected to hope, without sin, without strife, without tears. We look forward to that day, Lord. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before you're dismissed, I just wanted to give you a few book recommendations. Hope you've enjoyed this study. Um, in my order of what I think you need to buy, well, you need to buy them all. Okay, so three book recommendations that uh, have really helped me through looking at the doctrine of God's providence and, uh, and looking at the, this passage, uh, this, these uh, chapters in particular. First one is Counsel with Confidence by Joel James. You know Joel James, and this is a wonderful counseling resource. And you say, well, counseling resource, yeah. All those difficulties, those trials, affliction, hostility, things that come into your life. What are the verses? What are the passages I need to get to right now? This is a great resource for that. So go ahead and pick this up. I believe it's about $17 on Amazon. And I didn't check this morning. I'm not sure if we have this book in our uh, bookstore, but this is a great book. The other book I know we have in our bookstore, which you need to buy, is The Mystery of Providence by John Flavel. The Mystery of Providence by John Flavel. This has been a fantastic read, my favorite read of the year. And it is uh, uh, so helpful. It's like balm for the soul. This, this, this book will help you put God's providence in perspective as a lens in front of difficulties, circumstance, things that, you're, that when you begin to become self-focused, this is a great corrective uh, uh, Puritan read, John Flavel, The Mystery of Providence. I believe it's about $4 and we have it in the bookstore.
The last one is a uh, book called The Origins of the Hebrews. And this has been a really fun book. I read this over the summer, and it's one of the tools that uh, was helpful in synchronizing the archaeological record, the hieroglyphics, and, and, and whatnot with the biblical record. And there's very few scholars that, number one, believe what the Bible say, can, uh, that are Egyptologists that can actually read hieroglyphics and, um, and, and believe that the, right, that the timeline disclosed in the Bible for the events that occurred in the Bible is the real timeline. Douglas Petrovich is one of those men, and this has been an excellent read. It's about $50, so if you're into maybe a PhD-level um, dissertation, uh, it's, it's really excellent. I highly recommend it.